and mark them up. So great to see you all coming in. So welcome, everybody. Welcome. It's lovely to be able to speak with you and to be able to study together all the wonders of God's Word and His revelation. So this is Catechism Answers, and it's lovely to be with you. It's coming from Ascension, as you know. And I'm Dr. Petrock Willey. I was with you last week. I'm standing in for Docs, Dr. Scott Solem. And I'm speaking to you live from Franciscan University's Center for Evangelization and Renewal in Steubenville, Ohio. So it's great to be able to speak with you. Just before we go on and we look at the questions you've got, uh, just a reminder to subscribe to the Catechism in a Year channel, just to make sure you get all those videos. And also to remember to subscribe to the Facebook group, which explores together lots of the teachings which we're finding uh, in this study of the Catechism. A lot of our study goes forward through questions, and so we'll be speaking about some of the questions you've raised now. If you've got questions you want to post, uh, remember in YouTube, you can just put them in the comment section. In the Facebook group, look out for the weekly post where you can put them as well. And as I say, if you want to subscribe to the Facebook group, there's a link below where you can just uh, go in and subscribe there. All right, so let's get underway with our catechism in a year, questions, and looking at some answers. And as usual, we're not looking at the answers Petrock Willie has got, we're looking at the answers that the catechism has got. And so we've got three wonderful questions we're going to look at today. They're very probing. They took me a while to think about because there are many ways you can answer a question. Um, many different perspectives we can take, but as we know in the Catechism, you've got the saving truths of God's revelation. That's what we want to try and find. What would God say? How would he answer our questions? So a daunting, a daunting thought, perhaps, but that's what we can try to seek by studying what the Catechism says. So let's look at the first question. This question says, Jesus in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, gave the twelve the power to heal. And Peter and Paul even raised people from the dead. Why can't bishops and priests do that today? Okay, so we're going back to Jesus' uh, commissioning of his disciples. They were going out. We know lots of occasions in the Gospels and in the Acts of the Apostles where we see healing miracles taking place. We even see people raising others from the dead. What's the situation in the church today? And this is a really good question. The first thing that the catechism wants us to do, I want to say several things about this. The first thing is the catechism wants us to expect miracles. It's really clear on this. Miracles is not something that's in the past, that's only with the early church. Miracles are to be expected today as well. That's number one. Um, I'm very fortunate in that my own father was miraculously healed of cancer. And his story actually appeals in a book, for those of you who are interested, by a Benedictine priest called Benedict Heron. And my father then became part of the healing ministry in the Catholic Church in Britain. And there used to be monthly meetings and there were healing services. So I've been fortunate in having known about and seen God's healing power at first hand. In terms of healing and miracles, as you know, though, the church, as I say, expects us to believe in God's healing powers in the present, his miracles in the present. You just have to think of Lourdes. Think of the miracle of the Tilma of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Uh, there are, of course, for every saint who's canonized, there have to be two miraculous healings for every saint who's canonized. So the church takes this very seriously and looks for our prayers to be answered by God in miraculous ways. What the Catechism wants to also um, help us to see is the purpose of miracles. And the purpose of miracles is always to increase our faith. 
So I think, and this feels to me like the like what's behind the question to some extent is almost as though, do we feel there's enough faith around in the church? Do we feel there is enough expectation that God will act in our lives in ordinary ways and extraordinary ways? You remember that when the uh, angel came to see Our Lady, the angel Gabriel helped her to remember that principle, and this is what made the incarnation, the miracle of the incarnation possible. With God, nothing is impossible. With God, nothing is impossible. And one of the ways in which I've heard that helpfully explained is you can both think that nothing's impossible, he can do anything, uh, but also that it's impossible for God not to do something. Yeah, With God, nothing is impossible. In other words, whenever we pray to him, whenever we ask his help and so on, God always acts. It would be impossible for the God of almighty love not to act in our situation. One of the things we spoke about last week was how the questions we get, and I think this question has come out of priests and bishops, uh, why don't we see them performing miracles? All the questions we're getting in the second half of the catechism, second half, the second part of the catechism, is grounded and rooted in the first part. That's where we see, if you like, the key principles upon which we can find the answers to the things in the second part. And so if we go back, uh, there's the section on God's almighty love, and that's a really important section. It's, if you want to write it down, it's 268 to 274. That's where we get the account of the angel Gabriel reminding Mary about the fact nothing's impossible for God. I also said last week that another very helpful place to always go with all of our questions because there's nearly always a clue to how we should think about the answer, is to always go back to, to paragraph one, the very first paragraph in the Catechism. So we go back to part one in general, and in particular to paragraph one, because that is a summary of the teaching of the church. That's a summary of the plan of God, of what his overall intentions are, of how he acts. So if we look at that, uh, we can get some clues about what's going on in terms of how I should answer and understand this question. So if I just go back to number one, and if you want to open up your catechism just so you can see what's being said there, right in the middle there, it speaks about the problem which God needed to resolve within his plan. It speaks, first of all, about him calling all men to seek him, to know him, to love him with all his strength. And then he calls together all men, scattered and divided by sin, into the unity of his family, the church. And to accomplish that, God sent his son as the redeemer and savior. And it's interesting to note, isn't it, that um, the way the catechism is handing us the problem is not primarily in terms of healing the sick or even raising the dead. What is it that has scattered and divided people? It's not sickness primarily. It is the fact of sin. That's what God has come to overcome. So when we say that the purpose of miracles is to help us into faith, it's faith into God's work in the deepest sense. So I just, if we just remember, try and understand what that's all about, think back to how Jesus performed his miracles of healing uh, in the Gospels. So if you open, for example, look at Mark chapter 2. That might be something you could look up after this session that's where the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, we have the friends of a paralytic bringing a sick man to Jesus and letting him down through the roof. It's a very dramatic uh, account. You can imagine somebody taking apart the roof of your house in order to let somebody in. 
And then what does Jesus say to the man? He says, your sins are forgiven. So he sees the paralytic, the man who needs physical healing, lying there. And he speaks to him in terms of the forgiveness of sins. What then happens is a reaction to Jesus about nobody can forgive sins. Only God can do that. That's, that's if you like, the big healing. That's the big healing which is needed. And if you remember, Jesus rebukes them for their hardness of heart and for not understanding what he was there for and says, okay, what's easier for you to believe? That I've forgiven his sins or do you need to see a sign to give you faith in that? Okay, but so that you can understand I've forgiven his sins, I say to you, and he spoke to the paralytic, take up your bed and walk. And the man got up and walked. So what we see is that the physical healing is the sign of the spiritual healing of the forgiveness of sins. Okay, so what is it we're being called to have faith in? The miracle helps us to see what's going on below the surface, if you like, or to see what wasn't immediately so evident. And we can think of this when people are sick, uh, because in the section which I think you've read in the Catechism with Father Mike on the anointing of the sick, the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, it speaks there in, you might want to write this down, paragraph 1505, it speaks there about the, the radical healing that the anointing of the sick is dealing with. And the radical healing is always sin. So let's see, first of all, as it were, the ministry of the church, the bishops and priests, as it were, the miracle they need to, to bring to us is most deeply of all, and it's not exclusively, because we have the miracles of physical healing and even the raising of the dead as signs of this, but the most radical healing that is needing to be brought to us by Christ's church is the healing from sin. Now, the one, one last thing to say about this, therefore, is that God provides us and once we start thinking like this, we say, of course, Lord, I know what you do. You provide us with a daily miracle. Uh, the Eucharist, the presence of Christ in the Eucharist, is literally a miracle which we can experience and relate to every time we go to Mass. It is the teaching, isn't it, the Church, of the change of the substance of bread and wine into the body and blood, soul and divinity of Christ. Okay, that's a complete miracle. It can't be explained by science. This is God's daily miracle, which bishops and priests bring to the people of God in order for their faith to grow so that we may learn to ask God for his almighty love in all of our situations, including those of physical healing as well. And the word we use, obviously, is the word amen, so be it, I believe it. So at the end of the Eucharistic prayer, when the miracle has taken place, we say amen, Lord, I believe, so it is. And then, as you know, we have that beautiful prayer, Lord, I'm not worthy, you should come under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Okay, so the healing and so when we are facing situations where there is a need for healing, um, those whom Jesus healed or the apostles healed of physical healing, they would have got sick again. Those who were raised from the dead would have died. Lazarus was raised from the dead. At some point, he would have died again. Okay, there's no way through. There's no way through to God in terms of us physical lives, our lives on this earth, except through sickness and death in some way. But God, as it were, shows us signs of the fact that the route through sickness and death is to everlasting life. If we move through that, trusting in his almighty power to take 
our sin from us to heal us from our sin. So that's, I think, what I'd like to say about that one. Remember, there's miracles. There are miracles. Above all, remember, the Eucharist is the daily miracle of the church. And that's what uh, ordination is for, is to serve the people of God with God's almighty miracle, the miracle of this great sacrament of love. Remember as well of all the miracles that are associated with holiness in the church, like the saints and so on. Okay, You can't have a saint without miracles. Uh, and then remember Christ's real intention of miracles. The miracles that we see around us is in helping us to faith, which we can see from paragraph one is faith in God's ability to overcome that which has disconnected us from him. So let's move on to question two, which I chose because it follows on from this. It was, it's, again, one which I really had to spend a lot of time thinking, what, what does the catechism really say about this? The question is, what are the spiritual effects of a person who persists in sin? What are the spiritual effects of a person who persists in sin? Many of those words you could just really focus on. Um, we're back to that Number one, aren't we, in the catechism again? We're back to that um, whole point that number one highlights for us, that it is, let's just get that phrase again. Um, he calls together all men scattered and divided by sin into the unity of his family, the church, and to accomplish his God sent his son. Okay. Isn't it great with the way we can go back and just think about what that, what that implies for us? What are the spiritual effects of a person who persists in sin? I've always found it helpful to know that the literal meaning of the Greek word for sin, it's hamartia, um, is a word taken from archery. And literally... To sin, therefore, means to miss the target of the with the arrow you're firing. So it's literally you fired an arrow and it missed the target. Okay. That is the most helpful way to think about what sin is and what persistence in sin might be. Okay. So think of it, you've got that image there, if you like, of you're off course or you are off the road. And one of the things might be helpful to think of as a kind of a gospel passage here is that teaching of Jesus in uh, Matthew chapter 7, where he speaks about the two ways, the narrow way and the broad way. And he talks about there's a narrow way, and you can think of the narrow way here is, you know, the arrow fired to its target and hitting the target and Jesus says, actually, that's a very that's a very steep and narrow way. And it's, you know, it's, it's a tough climb. Uh, there's beautiful views on it. OK, you're going over mountains. It's everything a romantic and rugged sort of explorer might want. But it's a it's a tough climb. And on the other hand, you've got what he calls the broad way, which is, he says, very easy. It's it's broad. It's easy just to go into that. You kind of just get off the way and you start wandering around but you're not anymore on the way to the target. Now, that image is the one that the catechism decides to use to talk about our lives as a whole. And again, if you wanted to look, make a note of this one. It's uh, paragraph 302, which is the section on providence. And it speaks about uh, what did God do when he made creation? So what did God do when he made each one of us? You, you, you put the universe, it speaks about the universe here, but you can put yourself in, in the place of the universe here. The universe was created in a state of journeying. Okay, there's this way we've got to follow. A, in a state of journeying toward an ultimate perfection yet to be attained to which God has destined it. 
Okay, so the universe is created. It's got a, it's leaving one place. It's got to arrive at another. I've been created. You've been created in your lives. We're in one place. We've got to get to another. God has destined it. That means he's willed. This is the, the right place to get to uh, this, for, this point of, of journeying. And it says we call divine providence the dispositions by which God guides his creation towards this perfection. Okay, providence means God helping the arrow reach the target come back from when it strays off the right way and the way the catechism then describes the journey is says you you and i were made in god's image so we're made with a kind of an an in the arrow has got a homing instinct in it because being made in god's image means that we are made knowing that we belong to something which is that that target it's a it's an awareness we belong to a, a happiness which is at the other end, which is calling us. And we've got free will. The arrow here can kind of make its own way. It can be shot by the creator, but it's being given the ability to reach that end itself. Okay, so what happens? You could go from there then, and you could go to the section on sin and say, okay, so what happened to the arrow on the way? Um, and this is, you go to 397. 397 is about the first sin. And this goes all the way down to 406. But all of our, all of our answer is now really contained in this section. So what happens to this arrow? What happens to this journey along the narrow way? Well, 397 says, look at the first sin of Adam because it says all subsequent sin is this. So every time you think about what is sin, it's always this. And it's only one sentence. Man tempted by the devil, let his trust in his creator die in his heart. OK, that's the first point. The first point of how one comes off the narrow way and why one persists in sin, the deepest reason is a distrust of the goodness of God. That's the, that's the deepest reason. You let trust in God die in your heart. If you no longer trust God, then everything on the way looks hard. You're not really sure whether God really wants you to reach a destination. You're not really sure whether there is a destination. All sorts of things happen to you. And it says, and therefore, abusing his freedom, he disobeyed God's command. Okay, so disobedience follows the lack of trust. And it says all sin is like that. So the persistence in sin is about Obedience is about hearing God's word. Uh, so disobedience is refusing to listen to God's word now. Okay, I'm not sure I trust God, so I will not listen anymore. So therefore, I have to be guided by other voices than God's voice. Other voices are going to guide me. And then it says what happened. And this is, if you like, what the persistence in sin does. Uh, and this is number 400. This shows you, if you like, what happens when one moves on to the broad way. Do you remember number one talked about the scattering and division? The scattering and division is, first of all, that we are divided from God. So that's the first thing. That, that's what not being divided from God is called original holiness in the catechism. Being divided, therefore, is in a state of sin. We've lost original holiness, that link with God. And being in a state where all of our being is just going along that narrow way towards our target is called original justice. In other words, we are doing everything in accordance with our nature and in accordance with the good to which we're directed. Once we've lost original holiness, though, we lose original justice. We lose, we get scattered as a person. And so it says the control of the soul's spiritual faculties over the body is shattered. The union of man and woman becomes subject to tensions. 
their relations henceforth marked by lust and domination, and harmony with creation is broken. Okay, So if you think this is, if you like, the chaos sin causes in our lives is to do with the, the scattering um, of ourselves in terms of we're pulled in all sorts of different directions now by our passions, by our desires, because we no longer have that single focus. We are at odds with each other and we misuse the world around us. We don't have a kind of a right relationship with that world anymore. What did Christ come to do, you know, into that situation to accomplish the calling together of us who have persisted in sin because the his, God's creation persisted in sin? We can go to one last passage, which is paragraphs 54 to 58. And this speaks about all the stages of how God came into our situation of scattering and sin. So 56 says, after the unity of the human race was shattered by sin, God at once sought to save humanity part by part. Do you see how this is this idea always of scattering and division? Then it speaks about number 59. God chooses Abraham in order to gather together scattered humanity. God calls Abram. And finally, as we know, Christ is the one who, and it's in John eleven forty two, is called to draw together all the children of God scattered across the earth. So persistence in sin causes that scattering. It's going off road, but not off road, although we feel it's exciting. It's actually into a broad, easy way. It's very easy but we kind of maybe have the illusion we're off-roading in a more exciting way. The real off-roading excitement in that sense of challenge and so on is actually the narrow way, which God has placed us upon and Jesus comes to become our way to lead us on that, to lead us safely home. Okay, that's about persistence in sin, how God tries to overcome it. And that leads us into our third question, because I think this is really linked to, it's about the role of a bishop. So we're very interested in what bishops should be doing, quite rightly. Okay, this says, the question is, if a bishop is responsible for every soul in his diocese, which he is, then why is it allowed, and at times even prevalent, for bishops to avoid speaking out against public figures or movements in our culture that contradict church teaching? Okay. If a bishop is responsible for every soul in his diocese, which he is, why is it allowed? Why does the church maybe allow, and at times it says this feels almost prevalent, for bishops to avoid speaking out? against public figures or movements in our culture that contradict church teaching. What's the role of a bishop? Okay, given everybody scattered across the plain, what's the role of the bishop? He's responsible for everybody who's scattered by sin. How does he speak and what should he say to all those people to bring them back? And that is the role of the church. So if you wanted to look at um, 845, go and have a look at that. It's actually, we'll just read a phrase. It's, pretty, it's a, a pretty strong phrase about the role of the church um, in the role of bringing everybody back who's scattered. So this is 845. We're going back into part one again to find our answer. To reunite all his children scattered and led astray by sin, the Father wills to call the whole of humanity together into his Son's church. The church is the place where humanity must rediscover its unity and salvation. The church is the world reconciled. She's that bark which, in the full sail of the Lord's cross by the breath of the Holy Spirit, navigates safely in this world. 
Okay, there's the image of the ark there, or of a great ship. Okay, the bishop. What's the bishop got to do? He's got to get everybody into the ark. He's got to get everybody into the ship. And how does he do that? Well, the other passage you might want to look at is it's 888. So very easy to remember, 888 to 890. And that's of the teaching office of the church. And there it says, well, so what is the role of the bishop in the church? It's first of all to proclaim the gospel. The bishop must do this. The bishop, and it says there, the bishop's got to do two things. He's got to make sure people don't stray from the path. So the bishop's especial focus must be his flock, the church, okay? Although he's got a responsibility for all souls, he must make sure that the church is not led astray uh, and therefore can go off the narrow path. And for that reason, he has to, and this, this is the way the catechism puts it here it's got a lovely phrase um, okay it's to guarantee the people of god the objective possibility of professing the true faith without error okay the bishop's got to be able to make sure everybody can stay on the path and how do you stay on the path? By believing the truth. Number 89 in the Catechism speaks about dogmas as being lights on a path that prevent you from straying off it. Okay, it's, the image is always of the path. The dogmas and teachings of the church are the lights. And so what the bishop must do, above all, is make sure everybody knows the truth. Now, that will involve sometimes uh, directly pointing out those who are in error. Mainly, I think, and this is what the catechism is trying to do, it's to make sure everybody knows the truth. Okay, the teaching office of the church to secure everybody's ability to know the truth really clearly, to present it uh, persuasively, attractively, well, to give it as the good news of Christ, to make sure everybody not only stays on the path, but wants to stay on the path and knows why they're on that path. You, As we try and think about, well, how does a bishop do this? And this is why, you know, I'm very glad I'm not a bishop. You know, how do you do this for all the souls in your diocese? One of the um, names that St. John Chrysostom gave to parents was bishops in the home. And I'm always reminded of that because we can bring that question home to ourselves by saying, OK, so given this, that I want to make sure my own children in my own family are not scattered abroad, do not leave the main path. How should I speak to them? How should I act and how should I speak to them? At times, this may involve pointing out their problems, their errors, their giving, rebuking them. It may issue in punishments. At times, you may decide, I don't think I need to find another way of trying to help one of my children at the moment see what the truth is and help them. Sometimes it's going to involve a certain amount of patience always making clear by the way we live and we speak what the truth is, what we hold to, and what the good is to which they're called. And I give, I give you that instance of parents as bishops in the home only because I think that might help us see that although bishops can and should rebuke to prevent anybody straying into error, it's not the only mode of how they should speak. They should primarily focus on making sure the truth is proclaimed clearly and well, and that everybody understands why the truth uh, is held as it is. And that's why, of course, Christ came to reveal to us the truth. And it's we can close just by thinking that's what the catechism is, because the catechism is not the work of one bishop. It's not the work of a layman. It's not the work of one of us. 
Uh, it is the work, and John Paul describes it, it is the harmony of voices of all the bishops in the world. The catechism, he says, is like a beautiful symphony of the bishops of the world singing in unison and saying, this is the beauty of our faith. This is how we can learn what the truth is, which prevents us straying from the path. This is what we can encourage others to read to make sure that they are secure in the faith. And the catechism is not just a manual which contains the truths abstractly. It is written in a way to be the way we should speak to take responsibility for the lives of others, whether we're parents or bishops. If we read the catechism, I'm sure this is happening to you as you're reading the catechism and praying with it and meditating upon it so thoroughly, you're realizing it has a way of speaking, it has a way of thinking, which is gradually giving us a Catholic mind and a Catholic way of speaking. In one of my classes, uh, students lead prayer every morning, and one of the students, as she led the prayer, simply said, Jesus, may I speak well of you. Jesus, may I speak well of you. And that's what the catechism tries to do. And that's what we need to try to do, and what bishops need to try to do, to speak well of Jesus, so that people are attracted back and they are given the security and the stamina, the grace of perseverance to stay on the narrow way so they can reach their true happiness. So let's just close in prayer. Now, um, we've had our session together. We've, we can thank God for the gift of the catechism. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of your teaching church. We thank you that you've had such compassion upon us that you teach us, that you provide us with the truth, not just in clues, but unambiguously, clearly, faithfully, without error, that you give us this catechism so that we can remain secure in the faith. And you give us not only the truth, but you give us grace so that on the narrow way, we can be brought back from sin, that Jesus can reunite us to his church, and that we can travel together as the family of God on the way to the happiness to which you've destined us. And Lord, we pray for our faith to be stronger and stronger so we believe in your almighty love, to heal all the wounds of sin. We pray for our faith so that we can Pray for miracles in our lives and in the lives of others. And we pray for those to abound, Lord, so that the whole world can truly know that you are our Saviour and our Lord. Amen. God bless everybody. Have a good week and enjoy your reading of the Catechism of God's Word.